Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let me take cue no, from earlier speakers in this session and the sessions before uh, to express my profound gratitude to Dr. Pachauri and his team from Thierry and the Indian government. Uh, I come from ECOWAS, that's uh, the, the what we call economic community of West African states. We form a grouping of uh, 15 countries in West Africa with a population of over 300 million now. Thus, we form about a third of Sub-Saharan Africa. <coughs> and, uh, and we have 60% of the population still living in rural areas, as I'll put it. And 11 of the 15 countries are still LDCs. So this is one thing. And we have about well, that's 107, uh, 176 million people still having no access to electricity. This tells you how serious the situation is. Uh, the region actually, as you can see, is one of the what the poorest or the least developed regions in the world. But the good news is that we are seeing rapid economic growth in the past five to 10 years. Economic growth in this region today is averagely 10%. This tells you that there is rapid growth. And this is putting, I can say, extra stress on the energy systems. Um, and what is driving this growth? Actually, this growth is being driven by resources, resource extraction. They've been recent, what I call it, uh, 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 what, discoveries of resources. And almost those, all those interested in resources are trooping in. And that is really driving the growth. Another thing is the political stability that the region is enjoying in recent years. Apart from the few cases in the Côte d'Ivoire recently and Mali today, I mean, most of the countries in the region are now enjoying relative peace and the situation is quite stable. Okay. With all this, we just complain of the energy asset situation. We have also a large potential of renewables. That is uh, hydro, <coughs> as the Congo will tell you, 2%. At least we have been able to make it up to 16%. Out of 23,000 megawatts, we've only exploited 16%. Which means we still have a largely untapped hydro resources, which are yet to be tapped. And uh, we have huge potentials of bioenergy. As Dr. Moga put it earlier, up to today, 80% of domestic uh, fuel still come from, uh, I can say, by, that's biomass resources, which we exploit in an uncontrollable manner. <coughs> and it's not creating even health and environmental hazards in the region. Solar radiation, I think we have some of the highest solar radiations in the world, but we don't have a lot of solar uh, applications being deployed in this region. And wind, we have considerable wind in isolated uh, locations. And we still have the potential to exploit uh, energy efficiency technologies to the benefit of the people. All these have not been done. <clears throat> and this was what led to the establishment of the ECOWAS Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency. Uh, back in 2009, we got established. And with the main objective to create the enabling environment for renewable energy and energy efficiency markets in this region. Sure, uh, why only renewable energy and energy efficiency markets? We also have fossil fuels, but of course, uh, the fossil fuels are only located mainly in one region, in one country out of the 15, and even that country still does not have stable or reliable electricity. So this is to tell you that even if we have fossil fuel, that fossil fuel will not will fuel the engines of Africa. It will fuel the engines of Europe and America, not Africa. So, and uh, we've seen it. So the emphasis has been now, why don't we rely on renewables? At least nobody can carry the sunshine away. Nobody can carry the biomass away, it's too bulky. So why don't we focus there? And particularly for those who do not even have it, because what happens is some of them even have fuel, uh, fuel uh, uh, what call fossil fuel powered fuel, uh, power plants. And for most of the year, they had to put them off because they cannot afford the fuel bill. So these were some of the things that led to the establishment of ECRI, and sure, with the support, the technical assistance of UNIDO, 
and the support of the governments of Spain and Austria, we got started in 2009. And we focused on uh, what we call the four key areas, which were actually the main barriers to the development of these technologies in West Africa. That is capacity building, policy, uh, policy support, knowledge management and awareness, and then investment and business promotion. So I would say on the capacity building uh, side, we have been running quite a number of capacity building programs for policymakers, utilities, and uh, other interested groups, including the financial institutions in the region, to get them up to speed, to get their understanding of renew uh, renewable energy and the benefits they can bring. At the same time, talking of energy efficiency, and TRE is one of the institutions that we have a collaboration with on capacity building. Uh, since last year, we ran a few capacity building programs with them, and we're going to do some this year again. And with the policy support, uh, we as a region, last of the 15 member states, have come up what we call the regional policy for renewable energy and another regional policy for energy efficiency, which we got adopted just in October uh, last year. And these policies all set targets that as a region, we should try to attain. Sure, as I said earlier, like we have seen up to what we call it 10% uh, growth in the economies of the countries. And this is really putting stress on the energy systems. And the countries are forced to go on a more carbon energy path because they thought that is a quick fix solution. Uh, you'll be surprised to hear that today Senegal is constructing a 500 megawatt coal power plant and uh, Nigeria that closed its uh, coal, power, uh, uh, coal mines 80 years ago are talking about reopening the coal plants although they have a lot of fossil fuel, other fossil fuels and Togo and Benin are talking of constructing a coal fired power plant. This and we don't take measures today before we realize the whole region will be plagued with more carbon solutions, which is not the best. So we have set these targets, and these targets are for all the countries, adopted by all the countries. And all the countries, each country this year is supposed to come out by the end of the year, the contribution of renewables to fill this basket of ECOWAS targets. So some countries already have, and interestingly, we have a country like Cape Verde that is talking of 50% uh, renewables by 20, uh, 2015 and 100% renewables by 2020. Sure, uh, they have really made strides since they said 50%. Uh, as we get along, you get to see today they've already gone beyond 25% and they are on the way to the 50% target. And, but we have others who have not got any targets at all. This is the time to put pressure on them to come up with targets, tangible targets, to fill in the basket that we are creating for the region. And uh, we'll be working on that this year. So we also set even targets for what we call LPG, as I told you, domestic fuels. I say 80 percent, uh, biomass still account for 80 percent of domestic uh, fuels in the region. Uh, that is not a very good thing. <clears throat> so as I said, we also set targets for energy efficiency. And the targets were main, based on five main pillars, talking first of uh, facing out incandescent lamps, we still have a lot of them in, Ghana, uh, in the region. Apart from Ghana that has phased out incandescent lamps, all the other countries still have a lot of incandescent lamps. Almost 90 percent, almost 90 percent of the lamps in the region are still incandescent. And we talk of reducing the average losses in the distribution systems to the current levels of, uh, from the current levels of up to 40 percent in some countries and getting it as low as below 10% by 2020. And then we adopt region-wide standards and labels for major energy equipment by the end of 2014. And then we have to create instruments for financing sustainable energy and including carbon financing by the end of this year. Sure, some people may say they are ambitious. I say no, they are only challenging. And if you don't challenge yourself, you don't get results. So that's why we chose to challenge ourselves and make sure that we meet that challenge. Okay, but on the knowledge management end, we have come out, just come out with a product also, which we launched uh, last year, October, during the Energy Minister's meeting. And 
This product is supposed to, is what you call Ecorex, you can go to the size you see it. It's supposed to be uh, display renewable energy and energy efficiency data for investors and developers. So this is based on GIS maps on renewable energy potentials and other planning data, including uh, general infrastructure, transmission lines, generation plans, existing roads, and other infrastructure that could support the development of projects in the area that one might have identified to have a relative advantage in one resource or the other. So it will also include ongoing initiatives. Actually, it has to be a very comprehensive, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, what do you call it, portal, that as an investor for the first time come trying to learn something about West Africa, when you go there, you get sufficient information to give you a general direction of go or no go. So, like, these are some of the maps we have. These are very high resolution maps, and actually, uh, let me acknowledge the uh, support that we got from the Glo Global Environment Fund to develop this portal, and the other uh, partners who helped us to develop some of the, the what do you call it, the GIS maps, including the USAID who supported in the solar and wind atlas, the global, uh, uh, what do you call it, the GBEP, that's the Global Bioenergy Partnership that's supporting the development of uh, the bioenergy resource map. And then we have the World Bank, the S map of the World Bank supporting the development of the resource map for small hydro. So. These are some of the maps, and uh, they are quite detailed enough. You can go there, you can explore, you can see where there are opportunities, where one can go, what, where, what, what one can find. But you looking in this map, you see the dots inside the sea there, that is Cape Verde. So sometimes people ask where is Cape Verde. It's really not in the continent, but it's there. And we had to go there and put our office because they were the most proactive, and the country ready to show good examples on what renewables can do. So, sure, we also do some small projects. Uh, this was something we did, a call for proposal for small initiatives in rural communities that can support some activities. And really, when we did it, we got uh, up to 166 proposals received, of which we just shortly said 4 to 1. Of each of these 4 to 1 projects, we provide a grant of 50%, um, which is about 50,000 euro. Then the project proponent will also bring the other 50%, another 50,000 euro, and get this implemented in the rural community identified. And this will show typical projects that people were bringing up in uh, rural communities, which we agreed to uh, support. Sure, we are doing this with the support of some partners who agreed to fund this scheme. And we are on the first call. We already started this basement. We'll see how it goes. If it goes well, then we could go for a second call. But apart from that, we also go in for grid-connected, large-scale renewable energy plants. Um, these, are, these are the first renewable energy plants to come up in Cape Verde uh, at the end of 2010. And until then, we didn't have such plants in Africa, not to talk uh, not in Africa or West Africa. So these were the first to come on. And following this, we also got uh, uh, wind parks, four wind parks coming up in Cape Verde as well. So these were some of the motivations really that took us to Cape Verde because, like I said, it was the area, a very small country, very organized, easy to achieve results, and already was showing results. But this has really shown the way that so many other countries in the region have come up with very good project proposals to develop similar plants in the region. On the part of solar, you see that almost every country has solar PV parks and, uh, and what are called CSP plants coming up. Uh, next year, uh, that is this year, before the end of this year, we should see the commissioning of the largest PV park in Burkina Faso, which is about 20 megawatts. And in Ghana, even uh, by the middle of the year, we should have gotten 2.5 megawatts. And at the end of the year, they will add another 8.5 megawatts. Benin, half of these projects are likely to, come, to be completed before the end of this year but there are still a lot more coming. This shows that the interest has now come. They've seen the, they've seen the way they are following it. Coming to uh, wind, we still got some, uh, a few. Uh, okay, I'm almost at the end of uh, my presentation. Okay, we've also got some interest in wind, some interest in small hydro here and there, and the bioenergy. So now 
our perspective for this year is one to see how we can get the policy uh, targets of the member states also established to see every country moving and contributing very well to the regional target and also to establish South-South cooperation with countries like India and China. We've got a lot of collaboration with the US and the European countries, but this is the time we want to uh, extend a hand to the South-South countries and see. Then develop our capacity building plan and also support the other regions, that's the East Africa and Southern African regions who have shown interest in emulating this example and see how can we support them to also take off. So, like I said, we couldn't do this without the support of our partners, and I will always acknowledge them. And thank you very much.